So just, uh, just before I get started, I, uh, um, I want to thank the organizers for letting me speak, especially letting me speak last when everybody is, uh, is worn down in the submission. The, uh, uh, and, and as such, it's also uh, a great privilege um, to extend a word of thanks to Michael Schuckers and to Shirley Mills and to all of the other organizers here who have done such a great job putting on a fantastic <laughs> That said, you made one fatal mistake, which is not telling you when to shut up. So, um, so somebody will have to get a bit of trip to taking off the stage at some point. Um, and I don't, so I don't promise to keep it short, but I do promise to keep it interesting. So, uh, uh, however, I couldn't go with an interesting title, so I just sort of wrote down what I did. Uh, I, I think I think I had come up with a way of, of isolating individual skater impact on team shot quantity and quality. Isolating from what? Well, we'll tell you all about it in a second. So. The basic, basic idea which animates my entire professional career in hockey is that numbers are a pain in the neck and the pictures are great. There are quite a few numbers, in fact. But, just for an object example, I just chose two people out of a hat. That's not true. One of them is Evgeny Malkin, the other one is Conor McDavid. At 5-5 five five this past season, their teams generated 49 and 51 on block shots per hour, respectively. 13% more than average and 18% more than the average. Not bad. Certainly sounds okay. I'm better to have generate more shots than generate fewer shots. Let's take a picture. There we go. Aha. So they were chosen because it looks reasonably similar. And also, so not only are they generating broadly, there's, there's some other numbers there. We'll, we'll come back to what those numbers mean. Not only are they are their teams when they're on the ice at 505 generating quite a few shots, uh, more or less look like they're coming from pretty decent spots. The, uh, in case it's not completely clear, um, the blue means less and the red means more. Same convention as we saw in the earlier talk, which is good. I was, I was momentarily terrified that the previous talk had the conventions reversed and I was going to have to cry off. Um, but, but it looks like you know, standardization is slowly coming to us. The, so, so white is average. Um, I, I also artificially clip below the net, the, which is mostly for clarity's sake. Um, and in case people are curious, red is supposed to suggest danger. In particular, if you are facing a goaltender, facing um, McDavid's Oilers, or Malkin's Penguins, you have every reason to be very afraid. <laughs> you know, danger is red for danger, they there. But also, also the, the part of why I chose red and blue is that blue is supposed to be below average, below zero, below some sort of baseline, as in something that could be filled in with one. You know, think, think below sea level for those places. That's where you're getting less. No, that's great if you're a defender, it's not so great if you're an attacker. Also, even this is just raw data, this is what we saw um, with those people on the ice, and already you see some interesting structure. So, you know, that's a lot of shots from from FKN Malkin Penguins, but you're not seeing a lot of shots from the left face-off circle. And if you're a goaltender, you might want to know that. Uh, but you also might want to know what is causing those things. In particular, the reason I chose these two examples is that. Evgeny Malkin and Conor McDavid, despite seeing broadly similar results, could hardly be more different hockey players. Uh, the difference in age is about a decade. The difference in, uh, they're not even the same height, the difference in weight is considerable. You wouldn't really say they played similar styles of games. Uh, the hit totals received and given will not resemble one another remotely. They're both extremely good players, but they're very, very different. And not only that, they play in very different circumstances. McDavid is the best player on his team by an enormous distance, quite possibly the best player in the league by an enormous distance. The Evgeny Malkin is not obviously the best player on his team. In fact, he's not even, he's a center like McDavid, he's not even the top center on his team. So he's playing on a different line against different competition with different teammates in a different zone deployment, and also, because their teams are so radically different, even if their coaches wanted to, they couldn't possibly deploy them both at the same score. Because the Oilers and the Penguins don't play in the same distribution of scores, because they have totally different team qualities. So many of those things that, that you're seeing in those tracks, many of those things are going to be because of what Malkin does and what McDavid do. They're both extremely important players who strongly affect what happens on the ice. You can just tell that by watching. But on the other hand, it's also going to be affected by all of those other things. How much? So who is responsible for what? That's, that's the central question. The, that's, what, that's what I think I managed to come up with a good answer for. It's also one small technical point about how I make these maps, the, um, especially, which I, I mean, I really ought to describe at least a little bit, um, the, especially because we've already seen some heat maps which were generated with a slightly different process. Um, 
what I what I do for this one is I take so for every for every shot, so I want to take the shots which are discrete. And so here, everything this whole talk, I'm just going to say shot, but I mean unblocked shot. I mean a shot that is so on. so an unblocked shot is either a miss, a save, or a goal. But the only three choices. Uh, uh, in fact, at this point, I'm not even completely sure that I would switch to using all shots, even if I had location data for NHL shots. As you may know, the NHL in its infinite wisdom records locations for blocked shots. They record the location where the shot was blocked, uh, not where the shot was taken, which is a little frustrating. Uh, but we don't need to we don't need to air that particular grievance again. Um, the, and so what I do with so I want to take the shots and turn them into something continuous, uh, so that I can so that I can make an overall pattern. So, and so the way I do that is I take each recorded shot, I also don't completely trust all the recorded shot locations. In fact, um, that we were talking earlier about uh, a rink bias, about how certain rinks, certain scores, especially in the past and mercifully much less so now, um, can record shots um, too close to the, to the net or too far from the net, or uh, point shots somehow always come from exactly the same spot on the point, depending on what it is. These, mercifully, like I say, these problems are much less than they used to be. But we're also worried about scores just getting stuff wrong. It's, it's done by people after all, and they simply make mistakes. So every now and again, you know, especially if you follow a lot of mirrors on Twitter, you'll find people say, like, look at this one, and they'll you know, mention that, that you can see that the shot is taken something like 10 feet away from where the list is being taken. I mean, there are, there are mistakes like this, and we, we, I mean, you can measure how much those mistakes are supposed to matter and see how they come out. And so you use that, if you, if you like, you can imagine just taking a, a, a ball of sand of a particular size and just dropping it on a spot and so it smears out a little bit, but it's still tallest or set it on the spot where you have it located, and then you just add that up and then you just slice it and cut and make a picture. So that's the that's the process. And so we're we're simultaneously switching from discrete events to continuous events for the purposes of getting a hold of what we're trying to think of as true talent. And we're also supposing that with two birds and one stone getting uh, some of the measurement error out by assuming an uncertainty in the location of every shot. That's often what they look like on defense. Again, pretty similar. Pretty, right, that cursor is not supposed to be a little hand there. <laughs> the pretty similar defensively. In fact, when those players are on the ice at 5 on 5, um, that's not, doesn't look nearly as good for the opponents as it does for, as it does for their teams, but still you might you might notice some definite possibility to get your licks in against those players. But again, their contexts are so different. And if you just look at their on ice numbers, I don't think anybody would believe you and say, well, you know, they're clearly broadly similar quality players. I and mean, we know that there's a huge amount of context that we have to take into account. So how are we gonna do it? That's the game. We want to isolate individual skater impact on two shots, both forward and against. Today, that's all I want. And when I say on team shots, I mean team shot rates. I include in that where the shots are being taken. Um, strictly speaking, I also include the shots that come from the neutral zone. I just didn't make any effort to make the visualizations show those because I don't care. The, but, and, and also you can't see the shots that come from, from one zone zone, although every now and again they go in on certain goaltenders. The, I'm also not including any goaltender shooting talent. That's going to come up again later. Uh, and of course, I'm also going to put in a great deal of, of things like three shot movement for things that we simply don't have data. That's the game, that's the aim of the game. The new thing, uh, at some point I'm going to have to stop calling it a new thing because I've been banging on about it for a little bit now. The new thing is to not look at rates in the sense of numbers, but just say, oh, 5% better, or oh, 65 shots, or 25 shots, but to actually treat those shot maps as the first class data. This is my observation, this is my estimates. So the units of the whole talk, if you like, are shot maps, like this. And when I say isolate, we want to control for the aspects of play. We're not going to get them all, but we'd like to control for all the most important aspects of play, which are not in the player's control. Anything that they don't get to control with their own actions. The, so in particular, other skaters, teammates and opponents, both of them, but in that order, and both of them treated first class. Zone usage, if your opponent, if, you get an, if your team gets an offensive zone shift and your coach says, that's your shift, then you just go, you don't get to say, no, I'm going to wait for a defensive zone shift, I feel like playing defense today. <laughs> you know, that's, uh, not that anybody would ever say that, but you don't get to regardless, right? You take your shift when you take your shift, and similarly, if your line is with some schmucks you don't like, you still, that's your shift, you got to go take it. 
The, in fact, complaining about that is an easy way to no longer have a job. The, and also, you don't get to control the score. You know, you're having a great game, but your team's getting creamed, and so now you're down three nothing, and there goes your shit. Now, that's gonna, we, we know from experience that that changes how teams play. Uh, and so, of course, coaches have an extremely obvious role in the early part. They literally choose who plays with who online. They try to choose who plays against whom for opponents, and sometimes they succeed. They certainly choose up to making sure that mitigating players are being tight. They certainly choose which zones the players get to go in, up to a point. I mean, one of the rules is if you do a certain thing, you don't get to, you don't get to change your players. You know, that, that's like, they make the choices as much as they can. And then the score also, we suspect that there's some sort of coaching effect there, because, but we still, I certainly still don't know where score effects come from, although we're going to shed some light on that later. And this, this opponent business, we're going we're gonna to completely lay this one to bed. We're going to knock this on the head. I expect no more competition arguments. <laughs> Using my dad voice. So, and what we're going to do, how are we going to do it? So we have a Bayesian approach. This is, this is the, like a come to Jesus moment for me, if any of you know me. Mm -hmm. the, the, I very early have like freak interest in an architecture. The, but the idea is we're going to take a, a simple estimate of player ability, a naive <coughs> estimate. Anytime Bayesian tells me something about naivety, don't believe it. It means it's harder and mathematically more sophisticated. The, we're going to take a simple idea about what each player's ability is, and then every time there's a shot, or every time there's a length of time without a shot, we're going to use that to update our ideas about what we think of those players. So these five players uh, allow several shots against, and our opinion of them, of their defensive ability goes down. But then the players all change, and then a long stretch goes on when those players don't allow any shots, and so our opinion of their defensive ability all goes up. Sometimes some of those players overlap, some of them don't. So every time there's a shot for a long length of time, every, every shift, in fact, we're going to update our opinions of all of the players. And not just that, we're also going to update our opinions about what all of those other impacts are. You know, what does it mean to start in the ozone? We're going to, say, we're going to start by saying we don't know what it means. But every time, we're going to just watch and see, oh look, they started in the ozone, they got a lot of shots. And our, slowly our opinion of starting in the ozone is going to be, it means you get a lot of shots. How much we're going to, keep where, I, we're not going to do this by waving our hands, we're going to do this with the help of computers to count for us, because counting is going to be boring. Before the observations begin though, before we actually do this, so you imagine somebody says, I'm going to make a study of the 17-18 NHL hockey season. All of my work, sadly, is in the NHL. I, I am extremely interested in other leagues, but, but I, I'm drawn like a moth to flame to where there's more data. Uh, so before we make any observations, before I, I write any code, what do I know about the players, the estimates of the player abilities that I'm most interested in, what do I know about them, they are all in the NHL. This is the, I have a doctorate, so all of my appointments are doctor's appointments. Logic thing. <laughs> it's, it's, it's true on its face, by definition, without any, like there's no argument to have about it. The only argument you can have is if you're trying to imbue an NHL player with some sort of extra meaning. I mean, that's the NHL, he's playing in the NHL, that's what it means to be an NHL player. So that's, but that's a, that, that is a piece of information that we're going to take as our prior. We're going to take that as the prior, in fact, we're going to take that as the, the undifferentiated prior among them. That they're all NHL players, the same NHL players, some sort of average NHL And by average, what I'm going to, I'm going to constantly talk about league average, and this is worth a small digression to say what I mean. I do not mean I'm going to put all the players up in a row, make their estimates, and then put my finger on the one in the middle either by me or by me, or by some other sneaky way, and say that one is the league average player. Uh, it doesn't even make sense, especially because the, the intuitive objects are heat maps that uh, also begs the question, I need a notion of average that I can use before I know any of the player abilities. So when I see league average, I mean what you would get if you just measured all of the shots in the whole league, without paying attention to who generated them, or how, or why. Just take all of the shots divided by all of the five of that vice, and say that is league average. The same thing that you would, you know, if you just take your glasses off and watch a bunch of hockey. Whether you don't know who did it, don't listen. This is a strange analogy. The, but the league average is what you get if you just watch a lot of hockey without paying attention to who is doing it. That is the league average. All the skaters. The, now for today it's all skaters. No goalies in this talk. That's very sad. I'm so sorry. <laughs> you take this as, so we're going to take that as prior that every player's league average. And then there's going to be some extra sneakiness for people who don't really play very much. Because we're trying to get into our heads that we're going to, we're trying to get into coaches' heads a little bit. We're going to steal some of their knowledge about their player. In particular, we're going to steal the fact that if a coach is willing to play a guy for a whole bunch of minutes, that coach must think he is an NHL player and not just a fringe one 
the fringe ones get a little bit of minutes. And so we're going to say that the people who only have a few minutes, we're not going to change our estimate, we're just going to change our certainty about that estimate. We'll come back to that a little bit. Just be on your guard for sneakiness. With me, you all be sure. So how do I do it? I'm going to tell you that. There was a lot of that. Uh, I, think, I think it's extremely beautiful math and not even that complicated, but you can be the judge of that. The uh, years of, of sort of mathing on the head have, have changed my opinion of what is easy and what is not. But we're going we're gonna, to, when I say dessert first, I mean I'm going to give you the results first and then I'm going to tell you how I did it. So for now, what's the good of it? In fact, I expect you, in your infinite generosity, to just take it as read that I have succeeded in this task that I have in my back pocket. I do have it in my back pocket. Reliable player estimates of individual skater's ability, isolated from their teammates, their opponents, the score and the zones that they start their shifts in, of how they impact shot rates on defense and how they impact shot rates on offense. I just take this red, and I can do all things, and I have done this. What, what would you do if you had these things? What might I do with these things? I, I'm, I'm obviously I'm going to give the, all these things to you for free on the website. One thing you could do is you could, you could make it as the starting layer of a kind of war model. You know, the first thing is offense and defense, and then you also want to talk about penalties taken into account, and then you want to talk about who takes the shots, and then you want to talk about those people are they any good at taking the shots, and then you want to talk about goaltending, and then you want to talk about rest, and you want to talk about aging, what like that you could you could do that. Uh, I, I actually will not. Um, the I'm, I'm a very good man. The uh, and I I mean as I as I think I made it reasonably clear in the panel earlier about talking about war models. I, I strongly approve of war models. I simply won't be making one myself. You know, if God is great, everybody wants to make a war model, they should. The, and, and if you did, I think this is the sort of thing you would take as your foundational piece. Uh, Luke asked a great question in the panel about you know, how do you weigh these things differently, where you might, you might, if this was how you decided to treat one of those pieces, I think that's a way you could proceed. I mean, every war model is going to have multiple pieces like this, and this could be one piece. Uh, not for me. You could make it as the base layer of a set of models to simulate hockey games. Well, I am absolutely, that is unquestionably what I am going to do. Um, this, feels, this feels slightly sneaky to give this talk because I, like, my day job is running this website and the primary attraction on the website, at least this time of year, is creating predictions of what's going to happen in seasons and the predictions that I make are simulations, or simulate hockey games. So I'm going to do some Monte Carlo simulations, not today, later, tomorrow, soon, as soon as I get home. The, about what's going to happen. And, and so the, the base data for that is going to be taken from these estimates. That's why I need it. The, but that's not actually what's, what I like best about it. I could use it to understand which players are victims of circumstances and which are the beneficiaries. Who is carrying hope? Who is facing the tough minutes? Who is like who is being leaned on by their coach? Who is not trusted by their coach? I want to understand those things. That's extremely interesting. But still one dimensional doesn't really use the, the full heft of what we've got. Like the, the key thing, the thing I told you that was the new thing, was I was going to treat, you know, I was going to treat maps, areas on the ice, as first class objects. And so far there's nothing of that there. Well that, that I could use it to see how different players affect how the offense moves through the ice. You know, with this guy you get more, with this guy you get less, that's fine. With this guy it goes like this, with this guy it goes like that. She defends like this. She defends like that. Those, not, and you can say things like, oh, this is better, this is, this is worse. And that's sort of a warish kind of aspect. But if you want to talk to a coach or you want a game plan, then maybe you really care that when someone serves on the ice, the puck is going to go to that side of the ice 12, 15% more of the time. You know, that's information as, as a coach that you want to have in your hand. And <laughs> unfortunately, so I'm very keen about it on this slide. Unfortunately, I couldn't get as much of that into this talk as I wanted to. I'm just a little bit too cutting edge. So I have some sort of tantalizing ideas about that, and you will have to be, you'll have to go away hungry for most of it. The, uh, but if you had tracking data, I mean, this is, this is a, a, like a, a litany, you know. At the end of each, the end of each invocation, somebody says, and tracking data be with you. The, you have, <laughs> like, uh, but the, you know, it's, it's sort of like fusion at this point, it's 50 years off forever. But it's still worth keeping in mind, what will we do with it? Well, the same framework, you'll see precise, when I tell you precisely the mathematics that I used to do, you'll see why. The same framework could be used once you've done the jump from numbers to a, a function, in fact, anything that you can use that, that you can make a picture of. It could be something much more complicated. It could be like how configurations of, of 
how much players threaten in some sort of elaborate configuration space evolves over time. It could be any number of things. It could be a cat. So what are we going to do about this to try to communicate to you the full set of distributions? The shot maps are great. They fill up a whole screen, but just for one of them. And I need to talk about just two-dimensional distributions of them. And so for that, we're going to need a way to compress the information in the shot maps into single numbers so that then we can turn the numbers into great big pictures. So what I'm going to do with that is a thing which I call threat. So you weight the shot maps according to the league average shooting percentages for given locations. Those are league average unblocked shot shooting percentages. So how many times a, a generic person made of mayonnaise shoots the puck from this spot. We're not going to pay attention to who they are or who they're shooting against. We just know that they took a shot from this spot. How often do shots like that go in uh, at 5 on 5, which is in this particular talk is all 5 on 5. Although it turns out that you can, and I have, just done the whole thing again with the special teams. It's great. The, so this, this gives you a single number, it's called threat. And of course, because you take shots, shot rates, and you weight them by shooting percentages, what you get at the end of that procedure is goal rates. The units are goals per hour. Uh, and so you get numbers like 2.5. You're threatening 2.5 goals per hour, uh, which is nice and, and easy to keep in mind, because if you play an entire game of hockey, 2.3, in fact, is the league average. If you, so baseline threat, starting to sound like an epidemiology model. <laughs> The baseline threat for the league last year was about 2.3 goals, which is if you played entirely at 5 on 5 with generic shooters and generic goalies, you would see about 2.3 goals per game per team. It's about, uh, and, and I like to say that, like, I like threat, I use it for lots of stuff, but it's not really intrinsically interesting. It's a thing that I'm using to get at what I really like, which is these maps, ice them. Uh, I like to say that it's the worst XG model that you can write down without being laughed out of a room. The even worse one, which should get you laughed out of a room, is talking about scoring chances. Scoring chances is the dumbest XG model ever invented. It's the worst choices you can possibly make. Where you're going to take all of these shots and say, well, some of them, it's like they didn't even happen. We could have just slide down on the guys and it would have been fine. But other ones of them were fantastic, and we're not going to pay attention to how some of them were actually a different quality than one another. Scoring chances is a disaster. So, let's get back on point. That was a rant. The, 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 so Malcolm and McDavid, we're going to run through them, we're going to use these two as a guiding example to take us all the way through. So I showed you before what they did in terms of total quantity of shots as a rate, but now, now let's look at threat. So remember before they had, I don't even remember what the numbers were, 15% more, 18% more, something like this. Now if you look at the threat they generate on ice, 2.8 and 2.9 goals per hour threatened, 20 and 25% more than the average. We saw that they had those big concentrations of shots generated really close to the net where the goals come from. And, there, and so in terms of threat, you see that. So, first of all, this is just what we see. So you turn on, you randomly turn on the television, people are playing ice hockey, you pick a guy and you say, that guy, show me all his minutes. And you do that again and again and again for everybody, and then you take the time-weighted average of that, and then you make a density map of that. And this is what you get, this is what you observe in terms of threat, all relative to average. And first of all, you know, there's two things you should notice. It's basically Gaussian shape with some weird lumpiness. Second of all, oh, those are deciles for people who care about these things. 10% in the darkest bit, another 10% in the next ring, it's on. The, the other thing you notice is that it's skewed towards dull. Many of you will be familiar with these graphs because I put them up all the time. Um, and I, I label the quadrants, they're always labeled the same thing. Good in the top right corner means you are good at offense and you are good at defense. Or rather, when you were on the ice, you were observed as being those things. Uh, bad is in the bottom left corner, which requires an assess inverting the, the y-axis, so that dull is up in the top left corner. That means very little happened when you were on the ice. Your team threatened very little. Your team was threatened very little. Fun is what I call the other corner, when lots of stuff happens. This is fun for, for neutral people. Um, fun for people who like heart attack. <laughs> the, the, on, on certain other graphs, I occasionally, instead of calling it fun, I call it, we may win, but I may die. Uh, this, this is about what it can feel like. Notice the skew. The whole thing is skewed towards the null. It's not centered on average. And this is because, this is something slightly counterintuitive, when you define average the way that I did as the league average, there are lots more below average players than above average players. But I, when you have lots of different averages, you can do stuff like this. If, if the notion of average that I was using was some sort of median, then my statement would have been ridiculous on its face. But it's not a median, it's a different thing. And most of the players who don't get lots of minutes are not very good. That's why they don't get lots of minutes. 
And so you get this skew. All of these things, there's a lot of things which look a lot like Gaussians, but they move around a little bit, and exactly how and why is a lot of the content at the top. So the raw observations have this skew because the player distribution is like this. So where do these guys go? So Malkin and McDavid are right next to one another there. Great offense, slightly below average defense. Like we, that's what we saw with them on the ice. We haven't done any isolation yet. We've just measured this of what happened. And just for reference, because Malkin's case is so strongly influenced by Crosby, and because everybody knows Crosby very well, good Halifax boy, we have him up on the up on the chart as well, just for context, just for some extra little context. So Crosby is is in much the same that, slightly above average defensively, and extremely good offensively. And notice that the, the they're all in the top ten percent of the league, in the, the outermost 10% of this right there, they, they are all unusual players. This is part of the trouble with analytics, and part of why they get a lot of pushback sometimes when you say, oh, these are my results, but so-and-so players will say, oh, I, I, you know, you can't do right because it doesn't quite handle so-and-so properly, and or doesn't quite handle so-and-so properly, and then rattle off all the biggest names in the league, which is to say all of the weirdest and most unusual cases in the league, the people who play incredible amounts of ice time and have extremely odd personnel. There's, there's, we're going to talk about that a little bit later when I talk about some, some of the choices that I made. What about teammates? This is the distribution. So keep remembering, I haven't told you how I do it yet, but I have in my back pocket all of these estimates of player ability. So I can make a teammate estimate where I can say this is how all players were affected by their teammates. So here, if you're in the good quadrant, that means you had defensively good and offensively good teammates. That was their impact on you. Uh, and this one, you notice, is actually very close to being uh, Gaussian and centered at zero. And then we can see again, so now we start to see the difference between, the, you know, we're already resolving the players. McDavid has teammates who are offensively above average and defensively well below average. Great No, I didn't say that. The, <laughs> so the defensively below average is not no big surprise. The whole team is a pretty bad defense. But offensively above average is not surprising. Whatever good offensive players you've got, you put them with McDavid. Crosby is in a similar sort of boat. The, you know, being, being a defensive liability and playing with Crosby, that's one way to mitigate such a defensive liability. And, and Malkin now, you see that his teammates are dramatically bad. Interesting. Now the competition distribution, also notice the scales are all changing. We're going to come back to that. Don't worry about the scales just for a second. This one is skewed again. Again, it looks, maybe it's Gaussian, but it's, it's definitely not Gaussian all with the same radius. It's definitely wider than it is tall. So again, this is the impact on you because of your competition. And so I went, when I did this, I took the impact, the average impact of the weighted sum, of course, of all of the people you played with, and then I multiplied it by four. Because, so when you play at five on five, you have four teammates, not five, you are one of them. You don't count. You are not your own teammate. You are you. This is philosophy of 101. That, and when you do competition, of course, you do the same thing when we now you multiply it by five, because we play against five people. And now, so good here means you are playing against players who are helping you offensively and helping you defensively. So this is impact on you, so it can be a little bit unusual. That, and fun means you're playing with, against people who are good offensively, but who are weak defensively. That's, that's a little bit. So you notice the skew is to the right. So most people play the primary mechanism of matchup is not about good defensive players. It's about good offensive players. They're the ones who get matched up against other people systematically. The, that bias is very interesting. And now what we see here. So now, McDavid is being matched up against players who are helping, so his opponents are good offensively and also good defensively. The, sorry, I explained it, I explained it just wrong a second ago. The, the, this graph is not the impact on you, this graph is how good those people are. So if you're playing against players who are good offensively and good defensively, then that goes up and be good. But this is about your opponent quality. Sorry. So McDavid is playing, so up in the top right corner, that's where the hardest, toughest minutes are. And unsurprisingly, McDavid has the toughest of them. Whatever you got, that's what you put out against McDavid. You know, that's, that's where you, what, what you want your best players for, if not 
for such things. <laughs> Crosby, again, hard competition. Certainly the best offensive players, but defensively not quite as strong. Malkin, much, much, much softer. This is what you'd expect, considering if, if, you, if you believe the orthodox line that Crosby is taking the toughest opponents, then what's, what's next is what falls to Malkin in the second line. So his context is quite different. Now, what about score? So this is the score impact. So I've done a lot of work about score effects over the years. Um, and, and this is this just this past season. We're not going to talk about this too long. First of all, the, the little small numbers that are not especially easy to read are, uh, are threat over average. So when the score is tied, the total threat generated by, by both teams is slightly less than average. The average, of course, is league average, which doesn't have to be the same as tied. You just think of tied and average in the same, in the same sentence. But of course, so much of the game is played in the same harsh tied. There's no reason for tied to be zero. And in fact, when teams are tied, you see a little bit more from the points and a tiny bit less from in front of the net. When teams are losing, minus one, minus two, minus three, all of a sudden you start to see that red come out. Teams play better when they're losing. That's the fundamental tenet of score effects, or the fundamental uh, observation of score effects. The weird thing here, is that down one and down two are almost exactly the same. In fact, there's almost certainly no meaning in the distinction between plus 4.0 and plus 3.9. But it, in fact, teams are pushing very, very slightly more at, at minus one than they are at minus two. Some, in fact, and you see it again on the other side, at plus one and plus two, where people take their foot off the gas a little bit. Or possibly they're being pushed by the people who are, who are losing. This is, this is one of the things that I really wish I understood. Who is driving score effects, the losing team or the winning team? It's hard to say. But then once you get into blowout states, so plus three star means plus three or worse. You're up by three or more, you're down by three or more. Now all of a sudden, you start to see market changes where you get some darker colors. Uh, but it used to be, it used to be that teams when they were, when they were down three would turn on the Jets incredibly. Would, or possibly teams that were up three would, would take their foot off the gas enormously. And just this last year, the effect is dramatically less. The graph used to go like this, so the graph used to go like this. And now it goes like this. It's very consistent trend for an entire decade. I have 11 years of data. The first 10 years old will make last year different. Something, something got in the water. But what is the score distribution? What effect does the distribution have? Well, here there's considerably less uh, choice for coaches. If you're losing or you're winning, you still just got to put guys out on the ice. And, and the thing about score distribution is that once you're into a league, it tends to stay for a little while. You know, it's not like an offensive zone start where you know, one shift later and it's gone. Uh, and so this one is, is very linear. And here, McDavid plays for a terrible team. He's always being helped by the score. Whereas Crosby Mokin play on a much better team. Now, you'll notice that actually within the Penguins, they get the, the cushiest score distribution. They play when the Penguins are losing more. And they put their third and their fourth lines on more when they're winning. Um, but because as a team, they're winning so much more, then you, you see the effect for McDavid is very like, so in this case, McDavid is the one who's being helped. On the competition, it was Malkin who was the one who's being helped relative to McDavid, but now it's the other round. And then the tricky one is zones. So the way I model zones is a little bit weird. The, in particular, I'm extremely particular about this, the, what I consider a zone start is when you jump over the boards. When you jump over the boards, where, what kind of zone start you're in, that's your zone start, and it persists until you leave the ice. So if, you, if, you, if you're supposed to change on the fly, then you get a little, you know, little floating thing like my kids TV that says F, F for on the fly. And it stays over your head through all of the face-offs you take or your teammates take until you leave the ice. And everything you did was an on the fly shift. On the other hand, if you start in the defensive zone, and then you immediately get the puck up, you win the face-off, you immediately get the puck up the ice, you take a shot on that goaltender, he saves it, you get an offensive zone face-off, and you stay out, that is still a defensive zone start. You started your shift in the defensive zone. Maybe you stay on, but your teammate changes for him. It's an offensive zone shift. That's, that's when he came over the boards. So you have to keep track of all these things. In particular, it means they don't always match up. You can have a defensive zone start for all five guys on the ice, where the other five guys are not on an offensive zone shift start. They are continuing their previous shift, which is starting wherever it started. The, this, has, this changes, I think, is extremely important, and I argue philosophically that people who don't like it, the, I, I argue that I fair few things. The, uh, but it colors what goes on later because they don't have to match up the way you'd expect. The individual profiles themselves are also interesting, and I did them differently for home teams and for away teams because the rules for changing players are tied into where the zones are, and also they're different. 
the rules themselves of the game are different for home games and away games. And this is precisely where, where that leather hits the rug. It's when you're making changes which are associated with zone. So, but mostly it follows the profile. You expect these against starting in your own defensive zone. If you're the home team, you expect to give up a whole pile of shots, and you expect to get relatively few. Neutral zone, you expect to get very few. The, the defensive impact is very interesting. It's very close to average. On the fly, sorry, an offensive zone over on the other side is, is again what you expect. You get lots and you don't get shot on very much. The team has to go the length of the ice to put the puck in your net. It's going to happen less. The thing that's really unusual is that when you isolate it out like this, the on-the-fly shifts are almost as good as the offensive zone starts. And this is because teams don't, because on-the-fly shifts are still choices that are made by teams, and they don't make them in situations which aren't advantageous. There's really two very broad classes of offensive zone shifts. Oh, sorry, of on-the-fly shifts. One is you have the puck in your own zone safely while a defender is standing with the puck on his stick. You make the on-the-fly change and you have clear, uncontested possession. You have to break out, but still, you very rarely see four checkers turn the puck over on such shifts, on such changes. Or you're taking a, a you're gonna dump the puck in and then your guys are gonna change. And so now you don't have clear uncontested possession, but neither does the other team, even if they have an advantage of getting the puck back, you're gonna send your four checkers in right away. You have essentially a kind of unweighted face-off in the right in the zone which benefits you. Those are the two broad classes of on-the-fly changes. And every now and then you the on-the-fly changes where you have control of the puck in their zone and you're changing behind them, that's terrible. <laughs> that's great for you, it's terrible for your opponent. The, and so that's part of why we see this. And then of course there's matching effects for the away team. And you see that again, the away team is when they start the neutral zone that have this effect on their offense, but, but, a, um, but a much smaller effect on their defense. And so when you want to add up all these things, you have to add up all 10. It's not enough to say, oh, well, well, I mean, if we're going to be serious, we're taking into effect context. We're going to say, well, what's his zone threats? What's his teammate threats? What's his component? What's his uh, competition? We're going to say, well, so-and-so, he had lots of defensive zone threats and, and not very many offensive zone threats. Well, what about his opponent? We're going to take his opponent's zone threats into account also. If we think they affect him and his opponents affect him, they're on the ice with him, but they all, we're going to put them all in a big bag. And the zone distribution, this one is the weird one. It's extremely Gaussian looking, more Gaussian than all the others, but it's shifted. Shifted heavily towards dull. The, and, and why this is, I think, will become clear in a minute. So I'm going to explain it in a second. So now we're going to see the R3 guys. And McDavid has a very ordinary uh, zone star profile. Crosby, on the other hand, has a profile which is um, much more favorable. He gets the offensive zone starts very, very consistently. But he also needs quite a bit of defense at some starts. So his numbers are biased towards Dahl, like you'd expect, because the standing start, um, the, sorry, that's, that's all I want to say about that. Malkin, again, has the most favorable one. He doesn't get the defensive zone starts that Crosby does, not nearly as much. Uh, but he also does get the offensive zone starts. So he's, he's getting the, the, the easy jumps and also not getting the hard jumps. Crosby's getting both. McDavid is actually being given uh, much more on the fly starts. Uh, he, he just played a lot. But we want to talk about scale. Oh, sorry, before I talk about scale, I'm going to talk about um, residuals. So these aren't really residuals. That's why I put the weird like, scare quotes around this thing. Residuals would be if I took, if I took every observation that I fed in and then looked at how wrong each observation was. Now, but I'm not going to do that. I want to look at how wrong I was about each player. So I'm going to make an, obser an observation, a whole host of observations for players. Way back when I showed you that point, so these are the, the raw plots. Like he said, well, this is what happened when he was on the ice. What, what do we expect would have happened when he was on the ice based on how good we think he is, how good we think his teammates are, how good we think his competition are, all these other contexts. You can add up that difference. You can add that up and then subtract it from what we actually observe and get a sense of how, how wrong we were. And so notice this is also skewed. People who are good at, at uh, applying statistical techniques will already know exactly what I've done based on, on how, how the pieces are coming out. In particular, it's skewed towards dull. That means we were wrong most consistently by assuming that people were average when in fact they were dull. The, which is what we were saying before, that, that the bulk of the players in the league are, are not as good. But we can also get a hint about what our model is not picking up by looking at where they fall on this thing. All three of these players fall into the, the right-hand side of the graph. So in fact, they were, all three of them, 
saw slightly better offensive results than we might have expected from, from the model that we chose to use. Uh, especially across the impact data. Uh, and then, to the isolated impact itself, this is very unusual. It's, it's also slightly skewed to the right. But this one's mostly, so this is just the, what are the talents of the people in the league? Uh, um, so this is, if you like, is the punchline to the, this running comparison between Malkin and McDavid. Now when you see this, McDavid and Crosby fall on top of one another, uh, way off on the far right side of being the, the league's premier offensive talent, and slightly above that and defensively, whereas Malkin's isolated talent is considerably less. Especially considerably weaker, still positive offensively, but considerably weaker defensively. After all, he's getting much easier competition, not that much worse teammates, much easier zone starts, and still giving up lots and lots of shots against. Whereas McDavid giving up the same number of shots against is doing it in the teeth of a heavy headwind, and with much worse teammates. And so we get quite different estimates of, of these two players' abilities, or, or actually, on the abilities I have to say interchangeably with performances, the, um, and I'm going to completely elide over the, the descriptive predictive differences that we were talking about in the war talk before. There's, there's interesting things to be said there, but not today. And so then if you isolate their offense, what do you see? So now, and that's 8.7, that means a threat of plus 8.7 over league average. So not 2.3, 2.3 times um, 1.0, 1.87. And again, you see this, this, I mean, they're, they're very similar to the raw things that we saw before. Uh, and McDavid again, so now we see the same, you know, that's um, uh, Chris Russell bombing away from the left point. The, the, you, I mean, you see that that gets attributed to McDavid in this case. And that's, I mean, so these, these are not, of course, their own shots, but their own impact on the team shots. In particular, this is, this is something very curious. In a lot of the stronger players, there's a discernible bias to drive and play through the right-hand side of the ice consistently, all that way on the right-hand side. If you look at the people who drive most of their offense through the right hand side of the ice, you get a longer list of the league's best players. The, if you look at the players who run most of their offense through the left hand side of the ice, you get much, much weaker class of players. In fact, one of the only ones who you if you'd say, oh, that's a real star, is Walken. And you see, it's very easy to think of that red ball as symmetric, but of course it's not. And that above it is, is it's considerably to the left. There's a play style thing there too. Um, and then what about defensively? So now we'll create isolates defensively. We see that all of those shots against, we're attributing to Malkin. That's his impact on the play. The, whereas McDavid's defensive impact is not what happened to him on the ice. Him on the ice, we see the same number. Like I chose them because they were similar. When you just watch them play, you see shots come against them at a broadly similar rate. It's the difference, the key difference is the contact. We see that. The, He's having actually a, a slightly better than average, minus 2.1, so very, very slightly better than average. And also, a lot of the benefit, i.e. defensively benefit is blue, is also on the right-hand side of the ice. I don't understand that, I just noticed it. But, but I didn't tell you anything about scales, because I wanted you to know what the pieces were before I put them all together on a great big slide that's hard to understand. But the scales are very important. In fact, sometimes the scales are what's really interesting. So that black blob that you can barely see, obscured by all the other things, that's the raw data that we saw. It's skewed up to where it's done like before. The green is the ice wood. It's actually almost per perfectly matched by the blue teammates on top of that. Then the competition is the red piece on top of that. The score is that tiny little orange sliver, very close to the origin. That long, thin piece. And then the zones are the ones slightly offset to the side. But once you see them together, now there's a whole bunch of things you can say. So first I want to talk about the distribution of the pieces. The, the competition, so there's, there's sort of several pieces which go together. First, the bulk of the players in the league are not especially good. However, replacement players, it turns out, are slightly better defensively than the average defensive ability of a player, but much worse than the average offensive. That's, this is the, the good field, no hit of, of replacement players, if you like a baseball analogy. You know, being good defensively is easier, and you don't even get a shot if you're not within the spitting distance of defensive ability. But what actually gets you to stick is offensive ability. You don't score, you put your name in the score sheet, and you don't get, you don't get the chance to really, like, pure defensive talents are, are rare, and they don't normally get their chance by being pure defensive talents. It's normally how you stick in the league after you've been for 
have to do sort of a new thing sometimes. That's kind of theorized a little bit past what I pay level, but the, so the, the competition is what coaches are choosing to match up against skews heavily towards good offensive players because those are the ones who get a lot of extra ice time. They're the ones who get a lot of our attention. And because of that, because all the terms in the model are all competing against one another, there has to be a matching skew to account for that. And, and in fact, it is matched almost exactly by, um, by that zone being off pulled towards double again. The, the precise details of that I think I'm going to leave for now, but I also wanted to mention how, how you can see roughly how the zone impact and the score impact, the score impact in particular is really, really small. That's a great surprise to me. I've made a lot of hay about score impact, but it turns out a lot of it is confounded with other things. Because you change your player assignments when, you, um, when you're losing or when you're winning. In fact, I, that my very first ever hockey analytics conference was in Washington, and I spoke about this exact idea. Is it possible that changing player deployments could account for score effects? Like, is, it, is the reason for score effects just because losing teams play their better players? And I said in very strong terms, that was not the answer. It turns out it is almost all an answer. <laughs> Uh, I was, I was, and, and if you look back at the top of slides, I still my website, they'll never go away. I delete tweets, but I don't delete talk slides. The, 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 and the method that I use there is hideous. The, and, and this is much more sophisticated. So there's that, and, and then of course all of these things, this is the key thing which made me realize I had to take the course I took, is that all of these things are related. You're playing tough competition, you're starting in your own zone. You can't treat those as independent, because they overlap. Because when you're playing in your own zone, typically the other team is starting in your zone. And they normally put on their best players. And that's when you get to play your tough minutes. So some of that effect is because of the zone, but some of it is because of the competition. And when you tease them apart, they can't both be at full weight, because then they count double, but they don't. The other thing is about the size of the competition and the teammate distribution. The teammate distribution is large, and the competition distribution is small. So teammates, this is, this is orthodox among, among nerds for, for a while now that teammates have a larger impact, and they do. That distribution is much bigger. And so if you want to say something generic about hockey, then it's unquestionably true that teammates are much stronger than competition effect. And if somebody talks about, oh, you can't talk about these results for so-and-so, his competition is so bad before they talk about his teammates, then you know that they don't know what they're talking about. But, but, that's if you want to say something generic. You want to say something sweeping and broad and, and applicable in the aggregate. Oh, I do. I do all the time. But if you want to say something specific about a specific player, you had best look. Because for specific players, their competition is sometimes quite a bit more important than their teammates. Now I have some examples for you. So these are the three, not, and not the three top ones. I sort of cherry picked a handle from the top list. There were ones that I think I you know about. Brandon saw it, his teammates, the impact of his teammates on him was almost neutral. He had, on aggregate, broadly average quality teammate. But his competition impact is minus 6.4%. Just because of who he's playing against, you would expect him, in fact, this is net um, offense and defense, you would expect 6.4% fewer goals, both um, in, in the good sense for his team just because of who he's playing against. That's quite a headwind to go into. And as a cadre, he's almost as bad. His teammates are also essentially identical to average. And yet his competition is very tough. And so for him, the competition effect is quite a bit stronger, much, much, much more important than teammates. And, and of course, it works in both ways, too. Chris Bogren, again, helped very slightly by his teammates, but helped a great deal by the fact that he's playing against what, some of the softest competition that any player is playing against. Uh, so his job is being made easier. He has a tailwind from competition. But in particular, I chose them because their competition impact is so much stronger. So, in fact, there's no results here. There's nothing to suggest that, that Saad or Kajir or Gorbin are good or bad or anything. None of their results are on this slide. Only the context, things that they cannot control. And the point is that, that it's simultaneously true that the teammates, teammates, are more important than Kalpajir. But if you're talking about individual players, you would best get down to it and find out for this player which are the things that matter and how much. That's the other key, too. If it's all about you to say, oh, well, this thing really matters, but if you don't say how much it matters, then you're yelling. So how did I do it? 
The method, I, I said before that I was going to take a simple, a, a simple thing, and I was going to update it after every shot and after every passage of bed without shots to change my estimates of what I was doing. So mathematically, how am I doing that? I'm obviously not using a piece of paper. Uh, in fact, I do it with a regression technique called generalized ridge regression. The, this, is, this is a great satisfaction to me because the people who introduced ridge regression had no idea at that time that it did what I just said it does. But it does. That's, that's the thing, is it implements an algorithm that it wasn't designed to solve. It was designed to solve technical problems. Um, and, and this word rich has nothing to do with anything about Bayesian update methods for anything. Uh, so specifically, you might want to know how did I do that in two? How did I do it with, with heat maps? So the model itself is an extremely simple model, just a linear model. So a linear model means, uh, well, it means that I'm doing it with matrix multiplication, which is fundamentally linear. So y is what you see on the ice. And so I wrote it y equals x beta because I'm trying to explain what I see on the ice using the other stuff. X is the design matrix. That's what I'm assuming are the things which impact what happens on the ice. So I list all the players, once for offense and once for defense. So that's about 2,000 skaters. Right? 891 skaters played in the NHL last year. They do double, and that's about 2,000. I'm a mathematician. The, then the zones. So four home zones, four and away, four away zones. I'm sorry, uh, four against the uh, scores, and intercepts. So I had intercepts too, just to, to capture anything that I wasn't capturing with anything else. But intercepts are very simple, clunky tools. They just sort of left over things. And beta is our estimates of the impact of each model feature. So, so x is, let's go over that a little bit again. The columns of x correspond to those model features. One for each player offensively, one for each player defensively. Uh, home offensive zone, home defensive zone, etc. All of those things just go in the columns. The rows correspond to little observations, what I'm calling mini shifts or micro shift. So this is much, an uh, extremely restricted notion of, notion of shift. As soon as one player goes off the ice, and somebody else comes over and says, okay, that's a new shift. Right? New set of 10 players. We treat that as formally totally separate. And the exit values are almost all indicators. They're just where you want the ice, one or not, zero. And then all the other things I rearrange to be on that scale of zero to one, so the evidence on the same scale. So this design matrix only has the information of who played with whom and under what context. It has no results or estimates in it. That's the whole idea, so you're trying to put these things into those pieces. The only thing we need beta and y to do is have the same units. <coughs> they don't have to be numbers. Whatever they are, just have to be the same. And to be able to do the calculations, they have to be things that you can add together and multiply by numbers. They have to make a vector space effect. And they have to have some sort of notion of size, so that you can talk about error. Is this, is this error big or is this error small? That's it. Uh, so in fact, any inner product spaces. If you don't know what an inner product space is, it is a thing where you <laughs> can have a notion of size. That's, I mean, there, there's axioms and stuff, but we don't need to talk about that. So for instance, a shot rate density map. You add them together, you can say which ones are different from zero as long as you define zero and then finding zero to be average. Or, when we have tracking data, a distribution of trajectories through some sort of configuration space, but all the possible ways that you could move, you could arrange these people in position in one place. You could take, you could take anything you like. In fact, I'm going to come back to that with something like where you could do even something with distribution and get yourself some error bars. Come back to that in a second. I did it. I did it with, well, there's one possible choice. I could say, I want the, the beta. That's what I want. Y is what I saw. X is how I chose to design the model. Beta is some sort of measurement, some sort of estimate. I can get a hold of it with a computer. That, so I could simply find the beta that minimizes the total error. I could just take, so, what, so Y is, is supposed to equal X beta. It doesn't. So I can just subtract the one from the other and say, that's how wrong I was. But that's a big vector of things, weird things. If I just took the transpose, so just put this one on the side and then multiply it by itself, I would get some sort of notion of the square of my error. That's how big my error is. And I could just say, well, I want to minimize that. This is, in fact, ordinarily square fitting. The, the beta which gives you that minimum is that. It's just a uh, matrix calculation. It's very easy. But in general, this is going to be overfit. You're going to chase all of the data. Every little tiny thing that happened on the ice, you're going to go scurrying after it and think that every time some puck bounced off a stanchion and went straight in the net, that, that showed the innate quality of all of the players who scored that goal. <laughs> you're going to chase randomness, and you're going to get fooled by it. So instead, instead of minimizing it's that first term, I mean, obviously we want y and x beta to be close. But I could say, I said I was going to use this assumption that the players are going to be NHL players. Well, if they're all NHL players, that means if I get measurements of their ability that are wildly different from average, then I know that's wrong. The, the farther away from average, the wronger. 
Right? We're assuming that we have some ground understanding of these things, that we know that they're NHL players. We accept the possibility that they're not all the same, but they can't all be too far apart. Right? People who are complete legends, we would know about them. People who are absolutely useless would, would never get to play. Uh, and so you add this term, this beta transpose, times lambda beta, and the lambda is a matrix which encodes precisely how you're going to put that information in. So in my case, it's actually a diagonal matrix. Um, uh, I'll tell you how I did that in a second. But this is not, this is called zero bias progression, where we're adding bias. We're saying, I'm not going to let this algorithm just do what it thinks is best. I'm going to shove it in a particular direction because I know stuff that's not in the data. I, I know this prior information. Before I looked at how they turned out, I knew they were NHL players. And I know that that information is well. And so then the error is going to be partly model fitting error variance, and it's going to partly be error where the data contradicts my assumption that they were all the same. And so we minimize that. So this is, this is part of a very general thing called the, the, the bias variance trade off, and, and every, every model does it. And if you go heavily towards one side, you're massively overfit, where you, you are just chasing randomness, and if you go heavily to the other side, you, you conclude that all players are exactly identical quality. You're heavily underfit, you haven't really done anything. So this line that lets us choose how we're going to encode our prior information, I chose a really simple one. I use this 10,000, um, where basically 10,000 is my price. You have to pay me 10,000 units of wrongness if you want to say that, that somebody is away from average. So it doesn't have any meaning intrinsically. It just has meaning relative to other ones. So I use that lambda for the players and the zones and the scores, but for the intercepts. For whatever was left over, I didn't want that to be biased type of zero. I let that go as, as close to zero as, as is reasonable. And then for the low bias time players, I, I snuck in the sneakiness that I said, where I, I let them have lower lambdas, i.e. A, a broader range of possibilities. I figured the coaches have strong opinions about the players who play a lot, but not super strong opinions about the guys who don't play a lot. Maybe the, that guy's an emergency backup. Maybe the fact that he's simply in an NHL game is not really proof positive that a lot of people think he's an NHL. You know, maybe that's some weird accident of circumstance. Maybe that's that we called this person up in the ACHL because three people took to themselves with kitchen knives. So that's that's how I did it. And because because we because I did this talk the weird way around where I showed you the results, uh, so I only have one or two more slides to just give you uh, crowd pleasers, as I say. Who who came up at the top? Who's at the bottom? Who has the great situation? So the best people, so Crowdy and McDavid, offensively. <laughs> Have the highest, and I put that little underline just, just so you would notice how different they are from all of them. The offensive impact of those other players, those, I mean, Roman Yossi, 12%, that's great. One guy who's giving you 12% over efforts, that's fantastic. But it's not 21%. And, uh, and, and then the rest, of course, is, is almost all a laundry list of people that we know are excellent players. The, uh, I'm sure some have fans will yell at me about Jeff Petrie, but his results are unequivocal. Uh, also, notice Mark Edwards last thing. Very strong offensive. Defensively, Mika Koivu should have got the selfie this year, wasn't even nominated. The, his, his impact on shots against is unreal, but he didn't put up any points. He knocked the selfie as a foul. Notice also, this is, this is kind of, I mean, lots of these players are well-known players, many of them known to be very good, but, but it's not nearly the like, glittering list of stars. Defense doesn't, doesn't get accolades in the same way. And what about net threat if you add them together? To my great surprise, Vinny Dadanoff comes out highest in there. But very unusually, um, the, the, when you look at the way Florida moved their lines around, you see, you see something that's quite counter to narrative. Where Dadanoff, wherever, his, wherever he moves, his line performs. Barkov, much bigger name, wherever he moves, his line underperforms. Even as they rearrange the lineup. It's very counterintuitive. Uh, but one of the things is you can, you can tease the whole part. Um, then after that, a lot of this is, is expected. Crosby, McDavid, Brendan Gallagher, he didn't appear on either of the two lists. But, but he's a real two-way forward, quite a bit of offense, quite a bit of defense, and you put them together and you get something very, very strong. So there's a glimmer of hope for the hat. Um, the, uh, I, I italicized the defenders here, but um, and, and again, another story, Derek Ryan has been a, a revelation for a And then who's at the very bottom? The, I'm going to spend too much time on this. Uh, Hayden Fleury played the entire year. Many of you have never heard of him. He, that's the reason for that. Justin Braun is, is more uh, sinner than sinned against in uh, San Jose Dino Fulov, uh, local boy of sorts, uh, features there also. Um, Jonathan Drew, speaking of, of light, raise a light of hope for the Habs, 
um, come to my class. And so just for one final thing, I thought I'd measure who has the hardest minute. Not, no results here again. Just purely all of the things outside of their control, who is in the, the worst spot. Brandon Sutter, famously taking hard minutes, he really is taking the hardest minutes, all of those things. So this is, so Crosby, personally, is plus 21%, just in offense, and Brandon Sutter, just because of all of the things that are going on around him, is basically playing into that headwind at all times. Uh, also, uh, Jean-Gabriel Pagno, the thing of a bright light for Ottawa, oh wait. Uh, and so that's, so that's, but, but if there's a point to a takeaway like that, I wanted to get the idea that, that the context that we're seeing in this case is all up on the same order of magnitude as some of the impacts of the best single players. That's the kind of magnitude for context that we're seeing. So what am I going to, oh, and the, and the most sheltered, um, uh, Shen, Sergei, Shen, Bozak, look at the, the, the ones who are, are giving the easiest bit. So what am I going to do later? I'm going to try to get some nonlinear effects from chemistry. I mean, isolation is all about what you don't, what, what is only you. So chemistry is about what about you and also this person. Um, and then for broader evaluations, you need some special teams, which is the same issue. It does work, in fact. And the goal is shooting talent, which you need something over here. And that's all. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.